For the latest on the breaking news now, I want to bring in CNN legal and national security analyst Asha Rangappa, legal analyst Laura Coates, and legal analyst Michael Zeldin, who was Robert Mueller's special assistant at the Justice Department. Good evening to all of you. Uh, again, I can't overstate the significance of this day and really how unprecedented it is. Asha, you heard the president. He is angry. CNN is reporting the raids on Michael Cohen's hotel room. His office, a Wall Street Journal, is reporting a raid at one of his homes as well. At least a dozen FBI agents involved. This is aggressive. It's aggressive, but I think we need to be clear about what was going on here. This would have been executed pursuant to a search warrant, which means that the FBI obtained permission from a judge to enter these facilities. They would have had to show probable cause that in these locations and in specified places, documents, devices, they were going to find evidence of a crime. And a judge would have had to agree to that in order for them to do it. So this was, I think, calling it a break-in is really um, characterizing this as something that it's not. And, and the crimes here apparently are related to bank fraud, which is obtaining money through illegal means from a financial institution and potentially campaign finance violations, likely uh, contributions that wouldn't have been disclosed as required by law. Let's talk a little bit more about that, uh, Laura, because our Gloria Borger is reporting tonight that the search was mostly related to Stormy Daniels, and, and a source with the matter said that the search warrant was very broad in terms of items sought, and another source said that the search included bank records. Why do, uh, uh, why do a raid like this, you know, instead of calling up Michael Cohen's attorney and say, you know, we need, we need to turn everything over? Well, I think there is this false assumption that everything is handled when you're talking about courts of law and search warrants with gentlemen's agreements about, why don't you feel like bringing me documents and I'll feel like reading them? You can actually compel somebody to do so, and you can also recognize that sometimes, as cooperative as somebody may appear to be, they may not be comprehensively giving you all, everything that you need. And so you have every right to execute a search warrant, particularly if there may be fleeting or evidence that may go away. For example, electronic documents that could be destroyed at some point in time or anything else. And let's be very clear, don't conflate the two investigations. Right. This was a referral by Special Counsel Mueller handed over to an independent U.S. attorney who is the, um, of, the of Manhattan, somebody who was chosen by the president. The president had a hand in actually interviewing, much to the chagrin of many, many people, who replaced the person he fired just last year, Preet Bharara. And the reason that is significant here is because there is this illusion here that somehow Mueller has been orchestrating this entire thing. What happened is a referral meeting. I may have seen something. This may interest you. It is not within my particular mandate. If you would like to or you feel so desired to do so, please investigate it. It was not a mandate for the SDNY U.S. attorney to do anything about it. It showed their own exercise of prosecutorial discretion and, as Asha talked about, backed up by more than just Mueller, a, ma a magistrate and the SDNY. Why U.S. attorney. So the president has conflated the term of being a witch hunt to include these two things that are quite distinct. Okay, so let me ask a quick question before I go to Michael. Does it, the attorney client privilege, does it apply here or does it not apply here, Laura? We have to wait and see because every single communication that Michael Cohen has had with Donald Trump does not necessarily fall under the purview of privilege. It had to have been um, counsel sought for the purpose of legal advice. Mm -hmm. A discussion on business, per se, would not qualify. If somebody else is in the room on a communication or CC'd in some way, it wouldn't qualify. And most importantly, mm -hmm. there is a crime fraud exception that says if the communication between the attorney and the client was somehow in furtherance of a crime, then poof, it goes away and would not okay. be honored. But this is up to not Mueller, up to a court of law to decide. I've got to ask, I don't know That's who's right. better to answer this, if it's Asha or if it's Laura. It, the reason I asked Michael why is the Southern District of New York investigating something that's possibly election crime, wouldn't that be the FEC? Wouldn't that be the Federal Election Commission? Is that Laura, well, right? Can I, well, I can, I can that's answer that's true. I'll jump in, Mike. It's okay, true that um, it's, it's, it is the FBC, and I know Asha will jump in as well on this yeah. issue. I know she's seasoned on this, on this as well. But the notion that the FBC has been a bit of a toothless dog when it comes to a lot of these cases, because you have to have the, not majority rule, but actually it has to be unanimous decisions about these very issues, about campaign finance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
And even when they have had the opportunity, for example, in the John Edwards case, to look at these examples of what may be campaign contributions, the future White House counsel, Don McGahn, was on the FEC at the time and said, this doesn't sound like a campaign contribution. Let's not go ahead and prosecute or pursue this in the same way, although it ended up having an ultimately an acquittal in an overall hung jury for John Edwards. <laughs> the notion that you have in this case with the um, this investigation being wrestled or wrangled by the SDNY as opposed to perhaps the FEC may be because they have been a notable toothless dog in a variety of ways. Now, President Trump making absolutely no attempt to hide his anger tonight over the FBI raid on his attorney Michael Cohen. Anger that sources fear could push him over the edge. Back with Asha Rangappa, Laura Coates, and Michael Zeldin. Uh, okay, everyone, so Asha, let me ask you, Maggie Haberman is reporting tonight in the New York Times, uh, and she tweets that she said, Trump is angrier than he has been at any point in, uh, in the many fuming news cycles, according to two people close to him. Uh, what that ultimately translates to is unclear, but both Trump and Cohen believe this is really Mueller and that uh, farming it out to the SDNY was a fig leaf. Both sources say that this was a cross that, that he has crossed a red line that Trump laid out for Mueller going outside his purview. So, um, you know, he said, don't, you can't investigate, you know, his finances and all that. That was his red line. Has Trump crossed, has he crossed a red line? Mueller? Don, I think we need to understand that when Mueller has an appointment by Rosenstein, as Michael Zeldin <clears throat> mentioned in the last seg uh, segment, he has a subject kind of scope. If he encounters something that is beyond the scope, he doesn't just shrug his shoulders and walk away. I mean, what if he discovers a human trafficking ring or child pornography? Does he say, oh, that's not in my scope, uh, go, you know, carry on? No, he has, he is, uh, the Department of Justice is by law required to investigate any evidence of criminal activity. So it will be passed on as it was in this case. What this tells me is that Rosenstein is actually taking his oversight responsibilities very seriously. He's not allowing Mueller to continue something that might very be, be very far outside his scope, not letting him cross that red line. Instead, he is allowing the regular prosecutors in the appropriate offices of the Department of Justice go along with this. And again, these are, this in this case, it's a U.S. attorney that was interviewed by Trump himself. So I, Again, as I mentioned before, he will be disappointed if he believes that getting rid of Mueller or Rosenstein or Sessions is in any way going to stop this ball from rolling. Yeah, this is coming at a time when the president's legal team is really diminished, and some say, frankly, they are outgunned by Mueller's team. Uh, is that the way you see it, Laura? Well, I see the timing as very curious, given the fact that just last week, the president and his team were talking about possibly sitting down with Mueller and his investigative team. So it seems very convenient that now, yet again, you have somebody who's conflating two issues, two separate and distinct likely investigations, naming one a fig leaf with the hope that if you undermine the credibility of the investigation, it will give the president of the United States political cover to possibly say either he won't voluntarily sit down with that team, for his vice of counsel, or he'll be subpoenaed by Mueller and his team and will be able to plead the fifth and say, it's not political suicide here. What I'm doing is not going to answer questions in a witch hunt because we know that Mueller is farming things out for fig leaf purposes as well. Mm -hmm. I think that the fact that he has this diminishing legal team is only going to, you know, you know, exacerbate the notion that the president's narrative must be for him to feel as though he has cover that Mueller is running a witch hunt and he's trying to hoodwink the entire American public, none of which has actually played out in the facts. Hey, Laura, two things, if you can answer quickly, what, what kind of charges might stem from this? Well, for Michael Cohen, you're looking at possibly perhaps bank fraud or perhaps tax-related issues, perhaps campaign finance issues. The president doesn't seem to have an exact link to this yet, so I can't anticipate what charges we brought okay. against him or anyone else. Well, let me ask you, then, because you talked about, you said in certain cases, this attorney-client privilege, it could be waived, right, depending on, on what, what's going on. So if the president talks to Michael Cohen now, is that an issue? Has he, has it, I don't know, has this ever come up before? Well, the notion of waiver is different. That would actually belong to the client to say that I do not want my attorney to have to be held to that standard of silence. What I'm talking about of the attorney-client privilege is that it would not protect communications if they're made in order to further a crime or to hide criminal activity. And also the notion of attorney-client privilege can only exist if it was just between the attorney and the client, not outside entourages, not third parties who were around, not mm -hmm. email communication with somebody who was CC'd or BCC'd on it. So if 
if the president is able to maintain the type of attorney-client relationship that actually values and honors the privilege, which means just one-on-one, -on -one, no one else around, in furtherance of legal advice, it'll be protected. If it's not, if it's about business, about anything else, Can about he do crime, it now? No. Can he talk he, to Michael Cohen now and it would he, be privileged? He, he could talk to him about issues, but I, I suspect there is a cone of silence they want to put between him and yeah. Michael Cohen at this point in time because he has a great deal of legal exposure. And I suspect the president, although he had lunch or dinner last week in Mar-a-Lago, wants to have a 10-foot pole between him and who he calls a good man. All right. Laura, thank you. Michael, Asha as well. I appreciate it.